Hello there, I'm Black Bright, and I was listening to, well, I was watching the Truman Show last night, so let me say good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on which part of the world you are listening in from. Thank you for passing by. Um, but yes, this is Black Bright Roundup. I normally call it the Daily Roundup, but I find the Daily Roundup being quite quite um, restricting, just in case I don't do one on a day. So I'm just going to call it the Black Bright Roundup makes it much less pressured for me and it makes it easier for you to follow and I'll put the date on it. Today I wanted to talk about the new legislation that there's kind of snuck in uh, regarding with the emergency powers and um, what you're allowed to do when you're out of the house or what you're not allowed to do when you're out of the house. That's the first topic. The second topic is to do with those people who have put in their visa applications and they don't know whether they're coming or going and they paid a priority fee and nothing's happening. And the third um, the third topic is about the coronavirus, um, sorry, the certificate of identification um, versus the ID2020 and versus the um, RFID. OK, so that's given you a little background and so you can sit there yourself nicely. hope you've got your cup of tea or your glass of wine. You're sitting comfortably. I don't know how long this is going to take. It shouldn't take too long, but it is three quite. Um, uh, let me see. Um, complex subjects. Well, complex is relative, isn't it? So let me start off with the. Um, the emergency lockdown powers that have changed again. Up until the 21st of April, during COVID-19 lockdown under the emergency powers, no person could leave the place where they lived without reasonable excuse. However, on the 21st of April, an amendment was made to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions England Regulations 2020 and it was revised to read, no person may be outside the place where they live without reasonable excuse. Now, what do you think about that? Is that petty or what? Is that pedantic or what? Are they just looking for any bloody excuse to pick on someone? That's what it looks like. I mean, and I don't even believe this is for now. I believe that this is for when they really start tightening the reins. When they start pulling those reins in a month or so, this is when these things are going to take place. Because at the moment, we all have our relative freedom. We're all walking up and down the street. We're all exercising. We're all going and doing our shopping and taking stuff to medication and all that stuff. So I don't think that applies. Now. I don't think they've made the amendment for now. But remember, those emergency powers are in force for two years. So they are looking towards the future. So basically, what they're saying is that you cannot leave your house without a reasonable excuse. You can't even open your door without a reasonable excuse. And what they're actually saying is that once you open your door, your departure from your place of abode has to be intentional. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to go outside and have a look at the sunshine. I'm going to go outside and have a look at the trees. I'm going to see what's happening up, up the road. I'm going to see if my car's OK. No, you can't do that. If you haven't got a specific reason for coming through your, run, your front door, and you've got the wrong type of old bill outside just happening to walk past your house and sees you standing outside your house and you haven't got any intention and he's had a bad day, his, his missus is giving him a hard time, you're going to get it. And you're not even going to know. How are you going to know? How are you going to know that you aren't allowed to stand outside your front door? Wouldn't you think it would be everybody's right to stand outside the, their front door. You'll think to yourself, judging from the laws before, that, OK, yeah, maybe um, I can't go for exercise. I can't go for a walk. 
Maybe I'm not going out for medication. Maybe I'm not going out for essential supplies. Maybe I'm not picking up a prescription. Maybe I'm not seeing, um, what, you know, my GP. Maybe I'm not donating blood. But I can stand outside my door. Wouldn't you think that? Oh, no, you can't even do that now. They'll nab you. I think it's absolutely ludicrous. Really, I mean, this thing is, when you really study it, you know there's more to it than meets the eye. I don't have to say so. We all know there's more to this than meets the eye. Nobody knows what it is. People can speculate, but there's more to this than meets the eye. I mean, you can't even stand out of your outside your house now. That's the amendment, legislation. Can't stand outside your house now unless it's for, some, for a reasonable excuse. And reasonable is legalese. Reasonable is subjective. Reasonable by whose definition? By your definition, you might think it's reasonable to stand outside your front door and look down, down the road to see what's going on just to get out of the house. You might think that's reasonable. The old bill might think it's not reasonable. So what happens? You get carted off or you get a fine. So that is that. So let me just tell you, remind you once again, what the reasonable excuses are, or the reasonable, um, well, reasonable excuse to be on the street is to get money from the bank or the ATM, to take exercise, to seek medical assistance, to provide care or assistance, including personal care to vulnerable persons under the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006, to provide emergency assistance, to donate blood, or to travel to, for the purposes of work or provide voluntary services, i.e. volunteering, where it is not reasonably possible for that person to work from home or provide these services from the place that they're living. So, what do you think about that, peeps? Not very good, is it? Some people say that, you know, you, could, you should be silent. OK, suppose you're standing outside your front door. The old Bill comes up to you. He's got a bit of an attitude and he says to you, OK, son, what are you doing outside your front door? And you say, oh, I just thought it was a nice day. No. No, you decide not to say a word. That was it. Because they say that technically you don't have to say anything. It's up to the police to determine whether or not you being outside your front door is a reasonable excuse. So he says to you, OK, son, what are you doing outside? And you're silent, you're stood, which is what they say you can do. It's equivalent to no comment. And so he's art badgering you and badgering you. Now, on the one hand, certain people might get away with that. Certain people might get away with keeping quiet. But other people, they might be accused of obstructing the course of justice. They may be accused of... Um, of lying, you know, it's, it's more or less an admission of guilt. So you have to use your discretion when you're dealing with police. If, they, if they're giving you a fine, you must give them your details. But if they haven't given you a fine, you don't, you don't, you're not legally bound to say anything. But like I said, you get an old bill that's had a bad day and sometimes you think, you know what, I just want to go back in my house with my family, I'll just tell the old Bill, look, I didn't know I wasn't allowed outside my door because who would know? It's not like they put it on the news. Every time they do an update, do they update date the world? Do they update us, please? Nobody knows. They sneak these changes in legislation in. Nobody knows about the changes. It's absolutely ridiculous. So it's like they're trying to catch you out at every angle, and they cannot say to you that you should have known. How would you know? It's not like you're going to go onto the legislation every day and say, oh, you know, I, I'm going to see if they've changed the legislation. Who's going to do that? 
no one's going to do that. So they bank on people not knowing. And when they don't know and they get caught, it's their fault. They say ignorance of the law is no excuse. So that's why I'm here, peeps. I try to update you as much as I can. But even me, I can't know all the changes. I just can't. Anyway, um, what else have we got here? Um, I think... I think that's all for that subject, so I hope that's clear. Be intentional if you're opening your front door. Know what you're doing. The second thing we're going to talk about is those people who have um, submitted an application. Submitted an application maybe just about March, just before the lockdown, just before all the um, visa centres were closed. They paid their priority fee of nearly 800 quid. And they still haven't heard anything from the Home Office. So applicants who submitted visa applications at the start of March 2020, just before the lockdown and closures of the visa application centres, are wondering when they'll be able to get their biometrics done, especially those who paid um, 800, it used to be 551, um, for priority processing and where it indicated results would be available or a decision would be available within one working day on their website. And a lot of people do that because the alternative is waiting six months. Anyway, weeks later, they haven't got it. So I was thinking to myself, you know, there is nothing to stop. I mean, the Home Office are key workers, essential workers. Why are they not working from home on these priority applications? That's what I want to know. Why do they have to wait? It's almost like they're telling people that because there's a lockdown, nothing is happening. None of the applications are being processed. That's the implication. That's, that's, the, that's what the inference is or the feeling people get. It's almost like, you know, because... You know, the offices aren't open and none of the biometric centres aren't open. Nothing can be done. I mean, I appreciate the biometric centres aren't open. But goodness gracious, you mean to say that these people who've paid all that money cannot at least get some kind of temporary card or something until the biometrics get done just to at least say, look, we've taken 800 quid from you. We're going to give you something. Anyway, and the 800 pen is not is non-refundable. They don't even say, oh, you know, OK, we realise that it's um, it's been closed down. All the systems are closed down because of the um, coronavirus pandemic. So therefore, we're going to refund you because there's no way we can get that information to you within a reasonable amount of time. It's unfair for us to take your money. So therefore, we are going to refund it. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be the moral thing to do? Oh, no. Anyway, November 2019, migrants were forced to wait months for a UK visa, despite paying the priority fee, which is on top of the £2,389 applicable in some places. Applicable in some places. In 2018, according to the Independent Freedom of Information um, revealed, 8,000 people waited longer than customer service standard of six months. 8,000. 2,618 waited more than one year. 221 waited more than two years. 13 waited more than 10 years and one person waited 29 years. How the hell do you justify keeping wait people waiting that long? How do you justify that? I mean, if you have an application, surely you're able to tell within minutes whether or not it's valid or not. Wouldn't you? Surely. It must be, I mean, these people have been looking at applications all the time. Either they're completed correctly or they're not. I understand some of them have to go through a more vigilant 
exercise, but it doesn't take bloody two years. It shouldn't even take a year. So, and data gained, in 2017, data gained under the Freedom of Information revealed that 6,417 applicants paid over £3.5 million in additional costs to prioritise their applications, their settlement visas, between October 2016 to 2017. So at that point in 2017, it wasn't as bad. It was 6,470. That's still a lot. You know, 8,000 a year later. But only 803 out of that 6,470 receives their visa within 15 days or less. The rest of them, I don't know how long they had to wait. Ridiculous, isn't it? So you can imagine if this is all happening from 2017, 2018, 2019, what chance in hell have people got now with the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown? What chance have they got if those people all those years ago were waiting, some of them waiting over two years, some of them waiting 10 years? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how they get away with it. And the thing is, it's not even a free service. If it's a free service, you could understand. You could say, look, you know, it's a free service. So, you know, you just have to wait until we give you something. But these people are paying thousands to get their applications through. So what else have we got here? Applicants should get an email reassuring them that delays are not because there are problems with their applications, but because of the pandemic. But does that really allay people's fears? Because if they're saying they haven't got a chance to look at them, because that's the implication, they don't have time to look at them. How can they, how can they confirm that there's nothing wrong with the application? How do these people do how can these people, these people might feel, okay, I don't have to worry. I haven't got my visa. It's because of the pandemic. And then afterwards, three months down the line, they, they get a letter to say, oh, your application, there was something missing on it or there was something wrong with it. Are they then going to say, okay, it was our fault. We told you not to worry. So therefore, we're going to give you an opportunity to amend your application. Are they going to do that? I doubt it. Most of this stuff is done by machines anyway. You haven't got humans. You haven't got empathy. You haven't got um, that personal interaction. So you just better hope that when they send you that email saying, don't worry, the delays have got nothing to do with your application. It's just because of the pandemic. You better hope that they've checked your application and they know that it's fine and that it's genuinely just because of the pandemic while there's a delay. It doesn't help people, though, because I don't know if they can take that email and give it to employers or give it to which whoever they need to give it to as proof that the process is going on and they are legit during that time. Because as long as it's being processed, they are legally entitled to be in the country. They're legal citizens. So I don't know if that email qualifies them, if they do take it, if they want a, you know, a place to rent or you know, they want to remain in their job or they want to be furloughed. I'm hoping that that email will justify. <sighs> anyway, <clears throat> what else have we got here? Uh, what about applicants who had a job offer? Yeah, you've also got these applicants that had a job offer. They've come over here with a job offer. And now, because of this lockdown, employers don't want that responsibility. They're revoking the job offers. They, you know, they, they, all those people that had their visas, they're rejecting their visas. 
they're deferring employment. And technically they could, well, I don't know if they could, um, I mean, I hear that they could ha have them as furloughed employees, but I don't see how they can if they're not on the books yet. And in order to be furloughed, you have to be on the books since the 18th of March. And if these are new staff, I don't see how they can. So these people, you know, they've come over here, been promised a job, and then because of what's going on, they have to go back to their country. Well, once their visa is, once the, once they've, um, once the country is open, and provided, of course, they're going to accept people from the UK. That's going to take a while. So, um, what else? Home Office may soon discourage applications if numbers increase. And there's talk about them disabling the online service altogether because of visa application overload. But I don't understand why they're not working from home, seriously. And if they are working from home, why they can't get through. I mean, now is the perfect time. Why you haven't got people coming in, you haven't got people phoning you every five minutes because it's all diverted to some kind of machine, that you can actually get some work done. I know now I'm working from home, I get so much done, there's less interruptions. So why aren't they pushing stuff through and getting it done? Not unless they are getting it done and we don't know about it. Maybe we'll find out how many people have got their applications afterwards. I'd be interested to know if people are getting their applications or it's processing because sometimes we only hear the negative. Sometimes we don't hear of the success stories. It's always, you know, people brandishing people and, you know, finding fault. So we don't really, we don't really hear the good stuff. It's just like with the coronavirus. We don't hear the success stories. We don't hear about the people who have survived. We only hear about the people who have died. Similarly, it could be the same with these applications. Maybe people are getting them and we just don't know about it because all the papers are talking about is the ones who don't get it and all the queues and how long people have to wait. So hopefully it's not as bad as it looks. And finally, we've got the certificate of vaccination ID. Is it linked to the ID2020? The ID2020 is the plan for 2 billion around the globe to be digitally identifiable. And COVID-19 is a kind of a tracking app. And then we've got the RFID, which is the radio frequency identification. So are they all linked? Will they all be linked at some point? Who's to know? So the RFID, well, we know what the ID2020 is. Um, for those of you who don't know what the RFID is, that's the radio frequency identification. It's that, it's that um, little rice grain thing. It's coated in silicone, silicate. And it's a skin over um, a processor type thing. Anyways, <clears throat> radio frequency identification, it cons consists of a tiny radio transponder, a radio receiver and a transmitter. Um, and it's designed for automa automatic identification and data capture. In Sweden, this integrated circuit device has been encased in silicate glass and implanted or installed as they like to call it, in over 4,000 Swedish nationals. And that was as at 2018. So there's bound to be a lot more two years later. And what it does, it can be used for financial transactions. It can be um, to access buildings, pass cards. It can be used as ID. It can be used as e-tickets for travel. It can replace a passport. Um, it can... Be you, it can contain hospital information, vital like your blood type and stuff like that. And if you're on certain medications, health details, insurance um, and dental details, insurance, employment details and stuff like that. I mean, anything that can identify you as an individual, it'll be on that little thing and it's slit into your arm. And what they're saying is that people who are who have tattoos and piercings are more likely to have it done 
because they don't mind their skin being pierced. Whereas other people, it's kind of traumatic, the thought of having a piece of equipment in your hand, turning you into some kind of cyborg or humanoid. And um, so you're half computer, half human, because basically that's what's happening. So um, what they're saying is the Swedes accept it easier because they trust their government and they reckon other people kind of resist it because, you know, they, they feel that their government is trying to exploit, trick them, you know, control them in all sorts. So and then, of course, we know that China has already got the social credit system that monitors and segregates or ostracizes those with certain types of behavior. The COVID-19 app, it will be, it's designed originally um, to track those people who have been tested, those people who've had the virus, those people who have not had the virus yet, and those who have a certificate of vaccination. So that's supposed to be its main focus. They reckon that in 2020, by 2029, computers will have emotional intelligence by 2045, they reckon artificial intelligence is going to be smarter than the human brain. And the thing is with um, the people that are talking about this is that really and truly they want to play God. They want to replicate humans. For some reason, they can't understand how humans have come about. Yes, they talk about um, evolution and stuff like that. But really and truly, they don't have the answers and they are trying to recreate humans, only trying to make them even more superior. So they're trying to play God. They're trying to say, OK, we've got the humans. They are bloody brilliant, but let's make them even more brilliant because we are man. We are we are scientists. We are technologists and we can do whatever we want. We can improve what there is. And that is that is their goal to always be one step ahead, you know, and they just cannot let it rest. They cannot believe that there is a, a greater force, a creator or a God or whatever it is that created man and woman. That can't happen. They, you know, it can't. So therefore, they are going to do their level best to emulate man. And in Japan, there's this guy and he's actually created, it's a kind of a humanoid um, that looks just like him. Talk about vanity or narcissism. But um, he's created one that looks just like him. But there again, you're looking at the bloody thing. It looks spooky. You know, you know, they look and sound like robots. And then he's saying the good thing about this is that it can talk and talk. And you don't. And when you get fed up of listening to it, you can switch it off. And that's what this is all about. It's about not interacting with people. people. There are certain people who do not want to hear people's opinions. They do not want to hear what people have to say. They don't want to know about different cultures. They don't want to know about anything. All they want to know is that people are sitting there obeying orders, just like robots. And then they'll tell you to do A, B, C, D and E. And these, and we just go along and do it, 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 and we just go along and do it, just like Stepford Wives. If any of you haven't seen that, you've got to see that movie. But that is what it looks like they're trying to create. And can you imagine how boring that would be? I mean, the whole point of humans is that we can challenge each other. There is nothing more boring than to be in an interaction with somebody and they're just saying, yeah, and agreeing with everything you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember in Going to America, Eddie Murphy and that queen. And he asked her, okay, what do you like? Anything you like. Well, what do you like to do? Anything you like to do. So will you do anything I say? Anything you say. She, well, stop, hop around on one leg. She degrades herself by hopping around on one leg. Like a bloody idiot. Just dash her away. Because he's not interested. There's no, there's no dialogue. There's nothing. How can you prefer? Well, some people are so arrogant. 
that they would prefer just to have somebody who they just want to hear their own voice. They don't want to hear anybody else speak. They don't want anybody to challenge what they've got to say. So some people are like that. But personally, I prefer an imperfect human than a perfect robot. And if I'm going to engage with somebody, I want to see that person. I want to see that it's got lines, you know, laughter lines and it can laugh and it can speak and it's talking in a natural voice. I mean, I know if people have too much Botox, they lose all their expression. But the fact of the matter is the majority of people are normal. When I say normal, they've got their facial expressions. But that voice, they need to do something about that if that's the, if that's the way of the future. Because I can tell you something, they'll soon get bored with that. And when they've made all these humans into humanoids, what happens with natural emotion? What's happening when, you know, making love or tenderness or the peck on the cheek or the hug and the spontaneity and the imagination and the creativity and, you know, just being spontaneous? Where's, where will all that go? You're going to have to tell this thing to do everything. So great, it builds cars, great, it, it packs shelves, and it can do the majority of things that people do. But is that what you want? I can't imagine that the human person would prefer to engage with a robot or something that they can control completely. They will get so bored. And then what do they do? Look for another toy, I guess. Anyway, the thing is with this um, COVID-19 app, what I'm thinking is, okay, it'll start off um, testing and working out who's got what with to regard the co coronavirus. But how do we know it cannot be um, geared up to ostracize and segregate and separate based on the protected characteristics like gender, religion, disability, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. How do we know that it can't be broken down to start targeting those type of things? I mean, the, the, the way that they're doing these algorithms, they can do literally anything. So Sylvia, she's the first humanoid. And she's actually a citizen of Saudi Arabia. I don't know if any of you have seen her. I mean, talk about bloody spooky. Really spooky. I cannot imagine having a robot. I prefer a robot to look like a robot than a robot to look like a human. You know, like in the olden days when they had robots, they looked like robots. Why would you make a robot that looks like a bloody human? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, now we've got these guys that they 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 put these um I don't know if it's nickel, but they've got they pierce their chest with these studs and then they attach this gadget to it. And it's supposed to it's called North Sense. And it's supposed to um Whoever wears it, I think there's 330 people who have got it. It can t tell them where the north is. And when, the when they're facing north, the buzzer goes off or it sounds like a heartbeat. And they're so excited about it because they know where north is. I mean, what's so great about that? And apparently it, the north is where the magnetic field is. And, oh, and the, you know, they can't go back to not having one now they've got this extra sense because oh, we've all got five senses that and we've got the sixth sense but that's must be the seventh sense or something it's an additional sense that they've got through this gadget two guys have, have made it i'm just like what is it it has is um three people 300 people around the world have it it creates neural pathways in the brain and expands the, the senses I mean, what next? 
I think people really, you know, the powers that be, all these scientists and technologists, they just have to be satisfied that who we are, we're human beings and we're fallible. And yes, we can't go working on all night and all day and you can't make all your profit off of us because we'd break down, we'd burn out if you did. But at the same token, I mean, you could, there is a time and a place and you can have robots can have robots for certain things, repetitive tasks. I mean, to be honest, we've got robots all over the place. At ATM might as well be a robot because that's replaced the people in, in the banks. And so we've got lots of things that um, simulate a robot. And, you know, and I think that's enough. I think trying to take over humans or trying to recreate humans is not the way to go everyone needs love everybody needs affection and if you're the only one who's not a humanoid or you and your wife or you and your wife and your kids they're the only ones that are not humanoid you're going to be very very lonely so if it's your intention to make us all humanoids and you yourself um not a humanoid or not a cyborg or whatever you want to call it then you're going to have a very lonely life and you're going to think, oh, I want my people back. I want some real interaction. I want to be able to laugh spontaneously. I want to be able to squeeze someone's hand and feel the vibration. I want to feel the energy of someone. I want to feel the emotions from someone. And yeah, you, rec you, you reckon by 2045, the um, PCs or whatever they are are going to have emotional intelligence. I don't think so. They're going to have something simulating emotion, emotional intelligence, but it's not going to be emotional intelligence. You cannot recreate humans. You're not God. You just need to be satisfied with that. But you know, man's, man's nature is not to be satisfied. It's always to find out more, always to do more. They just cannot just leave things as they are. They just cannot believe in the beginning and they want to destroy the end. That's all there is to it, really. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.